Can Ron Howard make America care about Formula One racing? You're watching Beyond the Trailer's review of Rush. Who's that? It's Nicky Lauda. He's just been signed by Ferrari. The showdown between you and Nicky is all anyone wants to see. The real question is, does Ron Howard have to make America care? Just last week, the studio behind Rush Universal made headlines when Chairman Adam Fogelson was blindsided by parent company Comcast, who decided to replace him with its own Jim Shell. Why? It seems to have boiled down to two reasons. One, the age-old argument that Comcast simply wanted their own guy in there. But two is that they felt Fogelson was too focused on domestic audiences rather than the global audience. Welcome to the new Hollywood. Yes, while American audiences used to make or break a movie, these days they only represent a slice of a film's box office pie. And sometimes a movie doesn't even need to appeal to American audiences to turn a profit. Pacific Rim has made over 75% of its money overseas. A Good Day to Die Hard, 77%. The Smurfs 2, 74%. After Earth and Hansel and Gretel, also 75%. However, the new Hollywood isn't just about the global market, it's also about sure things, which Rush is not. Sure, studios are happy to distribute and market these smaller, riskier pictures, but pay for them? No way. That's why even though Rush is directed by Oscar winner Ron Howard, written by Oscar nominee Peter Morgan, and stars Thor, its $50 million budget had to be assembled independently, largely in Britain. A pedigree that the film proudly boasts, and should, as British picks tend to have an edge during awards season. And make no mistake, Rush is a serious awards contender, as Chris Hemsworth seeks some legitimacy as an actor sans cape, and Howard likewise after the damage done by his Da Vinci Code flicks and The Dilemma. But while I like this movie's BAFTA chances, it's going to be a little harder stateside, since nobody here knows who the hell James Hunt or Nicky Lauda are. And while our money might not matter as much these days, our gold still does. Ron Howard pulls a fast one here, luring you into the theater with Thor, a naked Thor by the way, very naked, but you will find yourself leaving a Daniel Bruhl fan. He was just phenomenal. Although I found myself wondering if that was because the Nicky Lauda storyline was stronger than the James Hunt storyline and Bruhl was a stronger actor, or because I just related more with Nicky Lauda as a person. Uh, because the movie really does kind of have you or ask you to choose uh, who you relate to more. Are you a James Hunt or a Nicky Lauda? Because their lifestyle, their lifestyles and, and viewpoints and how to live life are, and how to compete are just so incredibly different. Uh, but either way, though, I think this is a little bit of a concern for Chris Hemsworth because this is the second time he's being overshadowed in a film where he's supposed to be the star. The first, obviously, is Thor. I feel that Tom Hiddleston, and I think a lot of people do, overshadows him in those films. Uh, and we've, I've been asking and wondering here on this channel if they can make a Thor movie without Loki. And I feel here the same, almost the same thing happens. Uh, Daniel Bruhl is the Tom Hiddleston of this film. And they have a very Thor-Loki relationship, actually, between James Hunt and Nikki Lauda. Uh, so that was interesting. Uh, but I would like to know below who you are, if you're a James Hunt or a Nicky Lauda. As I said, I related to Nicky Lauda. Uh, as for the film itself, it got off to a slow and bumpy start. Uh, and I actually became a little bit concerned. I was like, another biography where they stretched themselves too thin with too much to cover. I was thinking they should have focused on either Hunt or Lauda because they just weren't going into enough, enough depth with any of them. But then as the movie came along and it found its groove, which is really to depict this rivalry between the two drivers, which was pretty phenomenal, uh, then it really started to pick up speed and to just do a wonderful job. And I would say the last two thirds to half of the film are really incredible. And it, by the end of it, it really, you know, I was really, you know, nailed to the you know, seat of my chair, uh, chair and I was just, I had such a good time and I was really glad that I had seen it. Uh, and also kudos to Ron Howard, by the way, who really directs this like you would think this was a newcomer behind the camera with something to prove. He makes really bold creative choices uh, and indie film stylings which were really refreshing to see with a race car film because I think at this point it's interesting I was thinking that also during the beginning of the film when it was a little slow that I was like I'm pretty familiar with the world of racing thanks to animation with the world of cars and turbo uh, that I, and I know I know a lot about how it works and you know kind of the, the different dynamics off, the, off on and off the track so this film really needed to elevate just being above that kind of procedural because I think uh, movie audiences, even if they aren't Formula One fans or NASCAR fans, know how this kind of works. 
But the movie, the movie does get there, and the settings are wonderful. I think because it's a low-budget film, they can't show you too much of the international settings that they go to, but the crowd enough creates this kind of different vibe. Like, I thought the Brazil one was fantastic. Monaco was fast but looked beautiful. Uh, and I just really had a great time. Uh, now, a lot of you have been wondering, what are this film's Oscar chances? And I feel while it is a contender, it's a long shot. But I feel if it's going to get any nominations, I think Daniel Brühl is a strong contender, I think cinematography is a strong contender, and score. We've just been talking about score recently here. Uh, one of you asked about it as a viewer question on Morning Movie News, and this film has a great score. Uh, also, uh, as, a, as an even further long shot, I feel it maybe might be able to get uh, Best Screenplay. And I, I have to say, I'm a little bit hesitant with Peter Morgan because he wrote Frost Nixon, and Frost Nixon made some stuff up, which really kind of put me off on that film. That famous phone call towards the end with uh, Richard Nixon calling up, uh, you know, David Frost, and them having that late night conversation was totally fictional. Uh, so there are some interesting moments here in the film where I, 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 I was taken out because for just a moment I was like, wait a minute, did Peter Morgan just make this up for dramatic effect? But uh, regardless, he did a very nice job. And nobody seemed to have a problem with him making stuff up for Frost Nixon, so he might get another nomination here. So that's my thoughts on Rush. I feel it's a must-see in theaters, by the way. Uh, and just stick with it, and I think by the time they get to the final laps, you'll be glad that you raced. So uh, write your own thoughts down below. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you check out these other episodes right now.